What about uh, digital transformation? Does that have an impact of how you write contracts? Digital transformation. Uh, so digital transformation is a, is a very tricky topic because it tends to 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 mean uh, something to everyone. Um, and uh, what's your definition then? Uh, before we talk about it, there. What's the opinion in UK? Yes. <laughs> nice. Well, the, the thing is, realistically, digital transformation. I don't think has one guise. At the end of the day, companies may be digital and they may transform into a digital organization for one reason or another so yeah i think i would be i would be at a loss um, <laughs> if yeah. someone if someone put a contract down on the on a table and said tom we want your organization to digitally transform us uh what is again i i think we go back to gregor's comment yeah what does that mean i mean it, it, unless whatever contract we're writing whether it's digital transformation, whether it's building brick and mortar store or or doing you know assembler coding, the answer the answer is if we don't define what we're going to do, or at least some endpoint, you mm-hmm. need to get yourself a lawyer mm-hmm. because <laughs> because you're going to go to court sooner or later. Even even if everybody is just really feels that that's the right answer, at some point you're going to end up at loggerheads. I think so. If I make a contract for 1 million euros, then, well, I need to have a certain level of trust to do that with that vendor. But if I uh, have a 10 million euro contract or 25 million euro contract, that trust is rather hard to get. Yeah, fine enough, yeah. <laughs> how, to, how should we solve this? Yeah, but remember why trust is needed. Trust is needed in, in, in the 1 million versus 10 million scenarios. Or oh, well, the lack of trust is indicated or implied by the level of contract paperwork that you go through. So in the case of, 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 the, of the European rules, for example, for procurement, you go through a PQQ process for anything of about 170,000 euros and then you go through the main ITT post. So there's two sets of paperwork there. Um, The same is often true when you procure in large organizations. And that's why you have finance departments that want to authorize anything over whatever the delegated authority will actually be. The reality is when you look at requirements, though, there might be three or 400 of them, and each one of them is a tiny, thin vertical. You think to yourself, okay, what do you actually want with this? And if you can get it into a position where it describes that vertical, usually a primary scenario, um, something that travels end to end. That is often actually quite cheap. The, the cost in most IT systems is not the primary scenarios, often the secondary ones, where there may be 100, 200, 300 of these. And if, but at the same time, each one of those delivers only a, a thin sliver of value compared to the primary scenario, which we assume to be 80% of the value or whatever number it might be. So, with that in mind, if you're delivering primary scenarios then, uh, all the time, then actually that becomes a nice easy way, if you like, of segmenting the work, but it has to be end-to-end. It can't just be part of an overall solution because then you get this potential for different economies or economic um, advantages to, to exist. So certainly from my perspective, the way I tend to prefer is to look at the primary scenarios first because they're the most valuable ones. Um, and then after that, after you've delivered all those, um, possibly in a delegated authority sort of way. So often a lot of these primary scenarios come in at less than 10K. Um, so you can just start delivering all those, possibly through multiple vendors, believe it or not, because it's still, from the from the um, European perspective, a competitive tendering process. All you're doing is saying, okay, we have 10 people expressed an interest in this tender. So what we'll do is we'll give each of them, say, 1,500 bucks, right? And we'll say, just do this one thin sliver of primary scenario, each one of them. Now, what you then do is 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 whittle it down by the quality of the work that they actually deliver. Does that make sense? So what then that then gives you is that the people who are better at it get more and more of the requirement as you go along. It's still competitive, but you, all you're doing is doing the typical Toyota production system, or in fact, most Japanese production system, and taking the work away from people who do it badly. Does that make sense? Um, so that's one way that, that, that can be done. I've introduced that into, into a couple of, well, one organization, major organization in the Northeast. And then the, oddly enough, the BBC seemed to be seemed to have procured one particular tender that way as well. And it still technically counts as a competitive tender. So hence, it's not breaking any other rules. This is a reality show. <laughs> Funny enough, yeah, exactly. It's to some degree. Like Paradise Hotel. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Very much so. Um, so yeah, so, but from our perspective, this is this that's just the way it's often it is it can be broken down into. Because if the delegated authority, if you think about it, trust exists because of the or one the lack of trust is, is uh, implies the paperwork. So if you introduce trust or reduce the impact of some of, of what happens when things go wrong. So 1500 quid, they wouldn't spare that, frankly, you know, most people. Um, it, it takes more <laughs> to deal with the paperwork than, than, than 1500 pounds worth of, of work that comes in. So with that in mind, that's one way of streamlining everything. So often a lot of procurement can be reduced down to a page or even half a page and a, an, acceptance, an automated acceptance criteria in the case of IT. So we've used that mechanism to allow um, organizations to do, who are interested to deliver on that. That makes sense. That's one way of doing it. So if we have a contract with a clearly defined success criteria, are we well aware of the risks? Then we don't need when we don't need a big contract. But you don't, yeah, you definitely don't need a big one. But here's the thing: if you're aware of the risks, that's one thing. But actually, here's the thing: what happens if you spin a coin, the, the spin a, I don't know, a, a pound coin, and the most you're going to lose is that one pound coin? I wouldn't worry so much about it. If you spun the coin and you lost a house, or you spun the coin and lost a company, that's a different you know, game. And that's really the, the second variable there. It's, it's risk and sensitivity combined as, as one thing in terms of risk. So if actually it doesn't matter if you lose 1,500 quid, that's fine. Because trust me, if you go down a 12 billion pound program and you find that actually 10 billion pounds in, that it's not going to work, that's a bit late. It's more than a pound. So <laughs> I'd be a little less sort of, uh, inclined to worry about that small amount by comparison. But it's it's something that has to be um, understood because as part of the organization or the enterprise as a whole, that has to be an optimization process as well. So try to reduce the amount of those. And, and, and then after 10 billions, when you find out it's not going to work, then that, that's when the blame game starts. Precisely. It may, it may even start before then, but absolutely, yes, very much so. And then it's back to the lawyers again. So <laughs> back to Tom's parents. <laughs> Any final comment from you, Tom? No, this has been fantastic. I, there's very little that I could argue with in that last uh, last exchange. So I actually took some notes because, very frankly, this trust relationship to contract provisions, per se, is a testable hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs>